I believe. What can I trust in then? This morning, we're going to go back to Proverbs chapter number one again. Proverbs chapter number one, and we are looking at this morning the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord as told to us by the wisest man that has ever lived, according to Scripture, Solomon. The fear of the Lord. And so we're going to stay mostly in the book of Proverbs this morning. What is the fear of the Lord? We get several definitions of what it means to fear God as we go throughout uh, these passages here. And so we're going to have six points really here today, six passages in the book of Proverbs that give us a good definition as well as benefits to fearing God. Last Wednesday night, I talked about two different kinds of fear. There's a a wrong kind of fear over things that we cannot control. You cannot control the motor vehicle accidents. You cannot control um, you know fires. You cannot control what other men may do. You cannot control you know a lot of things concerning your health and disease and things which are hereditary. There's a lot which you have no control over, and so there's no good reason to sit there and fret over it nonstop. And this is a wrong kind of fear. I have no control over that. So I need to just leave it to the Lord. And then there's a good kind of fear. The kind of fear we're supposed to to, to have instilled within us. And that is the fear of God, the fear of the Lord. To fear the Lord is not to stand and cower in fear that that He might bring down the gavel upon us or, or the heel of His foot or that we might make just one too many mistakes and He gets sick and tired of us and swats us off to the side. That's not the kind of fear that it is. The fear of the Lord is kind of like the fear of a good godly father. You're not afraid he's going to swat you off. You're not afraid he's going to come down on on you and destroy you. But you do sure fear disappointing him. You fear making him sad. You fear transgressing against his rules. Well, yeah, there's the consequences that come. But there's also the disappointment that comes along with it. A respect, a fear amplified when we talk about fearing the Lord. So let's look now at Proverbs chapter number 1. We read verses uh, 22 to 29, and God here talks about, uh, you, you, I've given you information, I've given you what you need to be doing, and you've chosen not to listen, and you've chosen not to obey. You've chosen to, to listen to foolish advice and to travel down that pathway to destruction. And so what am I going to do in verse 26? He said, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. But look at verse 25 right prior to that. He says, you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. You said it, not all my counsel. God said, you know what makes a healthy family? A mom and a dad who are married prior to having children. This makes a healthy marriage. This makes a healthy family. And our world says, wait, that sounds misogynistic. Wait, that sounds too old fashioned and limited. We want to broaden that definition of marriage, broaden the definition of the home and broaden the definition of the family and make it whatever we want it to mean. And God says, no, I've told you how it's supposed to work. If you choose to operate it differently, it's going to fall apart. It's not going to work right. You're setting it not my counsel. You would none of my reproof. And then God brings in the preacher or the evangelist. He brings in the word of God. God brings in reproof and they brush it off to the side. And that's why God says in verse 26, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, when your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then you shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. The world is pretty good at this. As long as things are running smoothly, they go their own way. 
They make their own rules and their own definitions, and they continue to trend more and more and more towards worldliness. And then a tragedy occurs, and suddenly everybody's got this God consciousness again. And suddenly everybody kind of wants to appear to care what God thinks again. That's what he's talking about here. Suddenly you're going to start calling upon me and praying that you're not my children. You, you've never been saved. I'm not, I'm not going to hear those prayers. The prayers that I'm going to hear are those of those who are saved, of those who are asking to be saved. You're suddenly you're going to want, oh, Lord, you know, please tell us what we are supposed to be doing. No, 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 you should have been asking that all along. Now you're in the midst of trouble and you want relief from your trouble. It says, because, in verse 29, you did not choose the fear of the Lord. So what is the fear of the Lord? Number one, look at verse number seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Now, of course, these chains are not the chains of a servant or a slave. These are the golden ornaments. This is that crown that you wear upon your head. These are the necklaces, the costly apparel that you wear around your neck that shows how much you are loved by somebody else. That's what he's talking about there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You've no doubt heard the saying that knowledge is power. And in reality, it is true. Knowledge is power. But the Lord is the one who gives true knowledge. It is only a fool who hates knowledge. It is only a fool who hates learning. And there are those within society today that care not for any kind of knowledge. All they care about is money. And whatever they have to do to get that money, be it legal or illegal, about gaining money, about you know lining their bank accounts with money, whatever they've got to do to do it, that's what they care about. They care about social media, they care about uh, stage presence, they care about popularity, but ultimately, they care about money. But what is the beginning of knowledge? Where does knowledge begin? You know as well as I do that the world today teaches that there is no God, uh, that, uh, that everything we see in existence today was a cosmic accident, uh, that one in a gazillion, if that's a number, uh, chance that you know this planet could have formed exactly where it is and that life could have somehow miraculously come from non-life, which has never been observed in, in all of time, um, in all of science, that somehow miraculously life came from non-life. Uh, and they, they teach this, and you're well aware of this, the contrary to what the Bible teaches, and that's their starting point. That, to them, is the beginning of knowledge. And so then, when they go into geology, it has got to be based upon the evolutionary theory. When they go into biology, it's got to be based upon the evolutionary theory, and it affects everything they teach biologically. Of course, this brings us you know, to modern-day thoughts concerning abortion and, and what that growing uh, person is inside of, of, a, of a pregnant woman. Well, evolutionarily, you know, evolutionarily, I don't know if that's a word or not, speaking, um, that, that, that what is growing inside a woman is nothing more than, than cells and tissue like a tumor that, if she doesn't desire it, needs to be removed. I think the only interesting thing is, is a tumor is a foreign organism that's not supposed to be there. It means your body's not operating correctly, whereas an unborn child within the womb means your body is operating correctly and doing exactly what it was designed to do. You just don't like it. There's a big difference between a tumor and an unborn child. When you start from the wrong place and you begin to build your foundation, you begin to build your tower of intellectualism and knowledge upon the foundation of there is no God, your, your results and your conclusions are going to be wildly different than what the Bible has taught us. Why? Because your foundation is crumbling. And so is it any wonder that one wing of your education falls and crashes over to the side and makes absolutely no sense at all? Because your foundation, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
You see, the Bible teaches us that God who exists outside time, God who is omnipotent and all-powerful, can speak into existence something that is full of design that we have yet to even, after thousands of years of study, we can't even understand, <clears throat> understand it to its fullest. But God, in an instant, was able to speak it into existence out of absolutely nothing. That God was able to breathe into man the breath of life something which science still is unable to explain. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so in Christian schools, we most Christian schools, uh, many Christian schools, I'll, I'll limit it to that, many Christian schools, they are going to use curriculums which start from that aspect, whether it's mathematics, whether it's English literature, grammar, whether it's you know, science or history. They're going to start from, the, from the, the foundation of there is a God. He created man. And he has given us his word so that we know more about him and so that we know more about how to live. And so we're going to go to God's Word and we're going to learn those things. And we're going to interpret science through the lens of God's Word. And we're going to interpret our history through the lens of God's Word. And yeah, we can even interpret mathematics. Wow, what incredible design there is in mathematics. All we're doing is put on paper what God already spoke into existence. It is the beginning of knowledge. And so we have to start there. And we have to start with our children and teach them finances through the lens of the Word of God. By tithing, by saving, by operating responsibly with our finances. We need to teach our children morality through the lens of the Word of God. This is what is acceptable behavior according to God's Word and what is unacceptable behavior. And there is a dividing line between it. It's not subjective. We need to teach our children concerning you know, marriage, concerning all, any number of things as they grow up, and our grandchildren, and our nieces and nephews, and anybody that we have the opportunity to influence, in any sphere of influence that we have, to teach that, yes, we start with the fear of God, whom I cannot explain, whom I cannot put into a box and completely understand, whom I am only given just the snippet of information here in the Word of God about, But we start there. It is the beginning of knowledge. Anyone who has started anywhere else is not building upon a sure foundation. It says over in verse 29 again, For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of God. Look at chapter 2, verse 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. When? He says back in verse verse 1 of chapter 2, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. We could go on, but I'm going to stop there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What else is the fear of the Lord? Turn over now to Proverbs chapter number 8. Here's a good verse which gives us some understanding as to what the fear of the Lord is. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 8. Did I say Romans? If I did, I meant Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 13. It says this. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. And here wisdom is speaking, and it's a great chapter concerning wisdom. And I've made the statement many times before that wisdom is not that difficult to find. Godly biblical wisdom. The Bible says that wisdom crieth out in the streets. All you got to do is listen, and you can find wisdom. It's not like it's hidden away down in some deep, dark cave that no man has ever found. Now, if you search for it, you're going to find it. All you got to do is open the door and listen, and you're you're, you're going to find godly wisdom. All you got to do is open the Word of God and listen, and you're going to find godly wisdom. He doesn't want to hide it from us. But what is the fear of the Lord here in chapter 8, verse 13? It is to hate evil. Look at the list he gives us here. Pride. Ooh, God hates pride. 
You know, we like to relegate the hatred of God towards some of the sins that we think are particularly egregious, but God hates lying. That encompasses all of us. God hates pride. Oh, he hates a prideful look. He hates when we elevate ourselves higher than we actually are. Who are we actually? Well, actually, I bear this title, or I've done these jobs, or no, no, who are we actually? We are all, every one of us, sinners. We were born in sin according to the word of God. That might offend some people, but that's what we were. We were born with a sin nature. We were born completely undeserving of anything that God has to offer, undeserving of heaven, undeserving of his grace and his mercy, undeserving completely and wholly of Jesus Christ himself. That is how we were born, wholly undeserving with a sinful nature. And throughout our life, we have done and said wrong things and disappointed God in many ways. Oh, sure, throughout our life, we have also probably done some good things, some things maybe that are notable or worth mentioning. But when it comes to mentioning it before God, there is nothing. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says, before God. The best that I can do, he looks at it in one sense and says, what is this filthiness? I can't touch that. So how should we view ourselves? Exactly how God views us. Sinners. And maybe here this morning you're a Christian, you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you've placed your faith and trust in Him, and He looks at you and He views you as a sinner saved by grace. He looks at you as His child. Maybe here this morning you're the child of God, and He looks down at you, and that's what He sees. Because He has forgiven you of your sins. They are cast away as far as the east is from the west. He has forgotten them. And now He looks at you as His own beloved child, who sometimes still disappoints Him. Hopefully confesses and forsakes that sin. But He looks at you as His child. God doesn't like pride. Let's not view ourselves as more important than somebody else to God. Let's have that, that humble, appropriate view of ourselves. Arrogancy. How arrogant it is to say that I know better than God. Or to say that I have some sort of an interpretation that transcends that of Scripture. And how many preachers today will take Romans 1, they will take Genesis 1, they'll take any number of passages, and they'll say, no, but I have a, a better, uh, more authentic, sincere understanding and interpretation of the Word of God than even God Himself did. How arrogant it is to say that. How arrogant is it to say that God made a mistake when He made me? Whether He only made me with one leg, or with a missing internal body part, or made me blind or, or, or unable to speak? How arrogant is it to say that God messed up? He says, we're to hate pride, arrogancy, the evil way, the froward mouth. This is that perverse mouth. In the mouth, the tongue can be such a very terrible thing, can't it? I've said this before, but you want to know what the most fearsome thing on this planet is? You may know what I'm going to say. A, a, a junior high girl. <laughs> the most fearsome thing on the planet is a junior high girl. Man, they can be vicious. Now, yeah, boys can be vicious too. But man, they can be vicious to one another uh, verbally, you know, with their words. Now, much, much of that stuff is going on on social media and not so much, you know, in, in the presence of one another. But man, uh, our tongues can be vicious. And it's not just kids, it's adults too. The froward mouth, the perverse mouth that, that, that has the bad jokes, that uses the curse words, or even the borderline curse words. Why can't we just clean up our speech and make it all wholesome? There was a girl in Bible college that I worked with that challenged me because, you know, I would, I would use the, 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 those mild expletives. And even if I were to just say, oh, man, you know, which, well, what's wrong with that? She would say, why do you have to use any of those at all? And she grew up, they weren't allowed, she grew up in a pastor's home, and they weren't allowed to say, oh, anything, you know. <clears throat> Why do you have to use any word, you know, say crud or something like that? Why? Just stop using them all together. I'm like, okay, I'll try. You know, that's going to be a little bit difficult to, to just weed all of that stuff out of my language altogether. Why do we have to use those words at all? And I know we all maybe draw the line in different places concerning what words we'll allow ourselves to say. But I challenge you this this morning. Why not take a higher standard when it comes to the things that you say? It's going to be noticed by people around you. 
if you're more careful with what you say than maybe some others are. It's actually going to cause others to respect you more. We're to hate evil. We're to hate pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth. In other words, where there is a love of God, there is a hatred of sin. Now, let me make this clear. It's not a hatred of the sinner. As I walk, and we've, I've used this picture many, many times, as I walk hand in hand with God via the Holy Spirit, as I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm close to Him, He's perfectly holy. And I'm called to be holy even as He is, which that's an unattainable goal, but yet I'm still supposed to try. I'm supposed to walk hand in hand with Him. I tell you what, when, when I want to say something or watch something or listen to something or be with people that uh, are in situations that are questionable, it's going to hurt. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable because of who I'm with. So to make it a little more palatable and a little bit more comfortable, I've got to distance myself from God and not walk so closely to the Holy Spirit so I'm a little bit more comfortable here in this world. We're not called to be comfortable in this world. We're called to be the, the agents of change in this world. We're called to be a light. My candles and my light bulbs are not supposed to be comfortable. They're supposed to be working against the darkness, not trying to conform to the darkness. If my light bulbs aren't conforming to the darkness, I take them out and I throw them away and I replace them with something that is going to stand against the darkness and do the job that it has been called and created to do. And as Christians, we are to be light bulbs. We are supposed to take that power from the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God and we are to change it into a visible light that others can see around us. We're supposed to be agents of change, that when they talk to us, that we give them the Word of God, and nobody comes face to face with the Word of God without it causing some sort of a change or a difference in their life, whether it be that of denial, deception, rebellious, or giving in and submitting to the Word of God. But nobody comes before God Almighty and His Word without it making some sort of a change in their life, even if they don't recognize it. You see, if I love God and if I'm walking with Him, then I'm not going to be comfortable with the wicked way. Pride and arrogance is completely opposed to biblical humility. So are you comfortable with sin? Are you comfortable being in those places or with those people where those things are going on? You say, no, not really, but are you comfortable watching them do it on TV? Are you comfortably comfortable uh, digitally putting yourself in those places. Oh, preacher, will you stop that? <laughs> no, I know. I'm talking to myself here too. Are you comfortable with that? The, begin the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Here's another one you were probably waiting on. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Look at chapter 9, verse number 10. We'll begin reading in verse 7. Of chapter 9, it says, He that reproveth a scorner gets to himself a shame, and he that rebu rebuketh a wicked man gets himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. God gives us some insight here into the receiving of wisdom. This wisdom comes from God. And what do I have to come to grips with first before I am willing to accept wisdom from God? I first have to recognize that I don't have all the answers and that I'm not as wise as I'd like to think that I am and I've got room for improvement. I have to come to grips with that, with that first. No matter how old or how schooled I may think that I am, how proper I may seem to be, I still have to understand that I have not yet arrived, nor will I ever arrive here on this earth, to the point where I no longer need wisdom from God, correction from God, knowledge from God. It is the beginning of wisdom. I want you to turn over to James chapter 1. Hold your finger because we're going to be back. Go over to James chapter number 1 this morning, verse number 5. If you're somewhere in the prophets, you are looking in the wrong place. And if you see Revelation, you're actually pretty close. It comes right after Hebrews. 
James chapter number 1, very familiar verse. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, which, that, hey, that's us. If I were to ask for a raise of hands, we'd all be raising our hands if you're awake. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We like to use that verse. The, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And boy, you could sure make application with those words in a whole lot of areas. But what he's talking about here is asking of God outside of faith. Asking something of God to help you in an area, to give you wisdom, in to, to make a decision in something while not believing that he's actually going to do it and circumventing him to go find somebody else to get that wisdom from. If you're double-minded, you're going to be unstable because you're trying to juggle too many things at once here. It is the beginning of wisdom. Don't be the double-minded man. Be the man that goes first to the word of God. Be the woman that goes first to the word of God and says, I need wisdom and discernment in this decision I've got to make here financially or this decision I've got to make with my career, this decision I've got to make with my children. I need discernment because I don't really understand and I don't really know. It's easy to want to go to the sources and it's easy to want to go to uh, the experts. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't ask the experts or go to the sources, but the first place that we are to go to is to the Lord himself. And it's amazing how the Lord, through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit, will direct our search to the right sources and to the right experts. And how He will give us calmness and clarity at times for right decisions. It is the beginning of wisdom. Have you ever heard of Taoism? It's T-A-O-I-S-M. Tao means the way. And it is a um, religion based upon gaining wisdom. It's kind of a Middle Eastern religion. And uh, it doesn't really have idols or statues or anything like that, no iconology uh, to worship. But they do have a book that they would read. And I remember watching, I was flipping through some channels on local television one time down in Florida, and I came across a channel where it was a, a Taoist service. And I thought, oh, this would be interesting. And so I watched a little bit of it, and he was reading from his scripture. I was like, man, that sounds really familiar. It's like, ah. So their, their wise scriptures say this, and I don't remember what it was. I'm like, man, that sounds really familiar. And as he kept going, I'm like, man, this dude is just quoting Proverbs as always doing. You know, you can't improve on God's wisdom, nor could whoever wrote the Taoist scriptures improve on God's wisdom, nor could the Book of Mormon, all they could do was change it, nor could anybody improve upon the wisdom that God gives us via the Proverbs and other books and the wisdom that comes through the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We start with the fear of the Lord when it comes to wisdom. we got big decisions to make. Yes, we do. Go first to the Word of God. Go first to the throne of God. Get down on your knees and say, lay before Him, Lord, here's my decision. Like Hezekiah did with the letter that he received, and you know, threatening to, to come in and destroy the nation. He went to the house of God straight there, and he laid it out there before the Lord and said, look, this is the letter threatening our nation. I don't know what to do. We don't have a strong enough army. I don't know how to handle this. Here, it's you, Lord. Will you take care of it? And so the Lord did. It is the beginning of wisdom. Number four, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. Look at chapter 10, verse number 27. Chapter 10, verse number 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. There's a guy I worked with in landscaping. He said to me, I don't, I don't want to be 60 and regret not having had fun when I was young. And so he was doing the drugs and, you know, sleeping with whoever he wanted to and drinking as much as he wanted. And he says, I just don't want to regret not having had fun when I was younger. And I said, you're probably not going to make it to 60 if you live like this, though. You're not going to live to see your grandkids. You're not going to live to go to their weddings or their graduations. Think of everything you're going to miss out if you have this kind of fun now. It's going to destroy you one day. You see, when we choose to fear the Lord, and by fearing the Lord, that means we believe in monogamous marriage. We believe in um, you know, the, the physical relationship after marriage, and we choose to operate in a certain way. Man, it protects us from a lot of things, a lot of STDs, a lot of uh, those problems that can shorten a life, doesn't it? When we believe in the Word of God, we say, you know what? I'm going to abstain from, from all forms of alcohol. 
I'm not going to let it be a part of me. You know, some preachers will say, do it in moderation and it's okay. And I say, why in the world do you need it at all? Nothing good ever comes from it. Oh, I can control it. Maybe you can control it for a time, but it will always end up controlling you. There's no reason scientifically, medically to have to go to alcohol for any reason. It's not like our water sources are so bad that we have to drink, you know, wine or, or beer or something to get liquids in our bodies. We don't live in that day and age. There's no reason to do it. It only causes harm these days, but some would teach that you can, but we say, I'm going to avoid that kind of stuff. And I tell you what, it's not affecting our liver. It's not giving us mouth or throat cancer to smoke the cigarettes. We learn to treat our body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, and it prolongs our days, doesn't it? We learn to not stress over everything and fear everything and to cast our cares upon the Lord, for He careth for you. And I tell you what, the relief from that anxiety and the fear, doesn't that lengthen your days? Boy, making wise and godly decisions all throughout our life, step by step, starting from when we are saved, maybe as a young person or even as an older person, but throughout our life, making the right decisions, it does prolong our days. In fact, in Ephesians 6.3, it says, you know, we're, we're told to uh, honor your parents and obey your parents that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. When you obey mom and dad, you don't stick your fingers in the outlets. You're going to live a little bit longer. <laughs> when you obey mom and dad, you don't go take off running out into the street. You're going to live a little bit longer. When you obey mom and dad, you don't grab whatever you find under the cabinet and start swigging it. You're going to live a little bit longer. You don't stick your hands on the stove. I remember as a kid, I'd, I had this habit of touching the stove every time I walked by it just to see if it was hot, which is fine until it is hot, and it was. And I had some nice pretty rings on my hand from sticking my hand on the burner, and uh, I learned to live a lesson that day. Um, one, I don't need to know if it's hot. <laughs> and, and two, uh, the best way is not touching it. Uh, there's other ways to find out if it's hot. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. Back in um, chapter 9, verse 11, it says this. We didn't read this verse, but he says in chapter 9, verse 11, For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. God does not promise a long life to everybody who's good and every good Christian. I'm not teaching a health and wealth and prosperity you know, kind of gospel here. We know there are certainly Bible examples of folks who uh, struggled all throughout their life. I mean, Job was a man after God's own heart. Job was good. Uh, Job man is a guy that we can strive to be like, but Job did not have an easy path. God does not promise that he will never bring anything difficult into our lives simply uh, because we're always doing what's right. That's not the promise at all. But the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. Next one, number five here. Look at chapter 14, verse number 26. Proverbs 14, 26, it says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. I like that. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. Confidence is something that you cannot just force upon a child as they're growing up. Confidence is something that is instilled upon them by a lot of things that we do and say. You know, as a, as a father, it's very easy for me to correct my kids. I, it's just natural, you know, to want to correct them. What's not quite so natural, though, is to praise them and to build them up. You know, I, I don't want to give them make them think of themselves more highly than they ought to. And I don't want to, you know, give them all the participation trophies and anything like that and give them false confidence. I want them to understand exactly where they are speaking, you know, bef before God and before mom and dad. Yep, you've got some things that you do that, that aren't right and that are disappointing to us. But you know what? You've got some things going on in your life that are good. And you're, you are making some good decisions. And you are good at these things. And as a parent, we've got to look for those things to point them out. You know, uh, because sometimes they may be hard to find, <laughs> but you have to look for those things that they're good at and be sure to point those things out to build a realistic confidence in them. What does the Bible say about confidence? I always think of Proverbs 28, 1, where he says, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. You know that feeling, just like I know that feeling of hearing that whoop, whoop behind you. You don't know exactly where it was. You just heard it. Somebody's getting pulled over, you know, so some, somebody is trying to, you know, some police officer is trying to get somebody's attention and fear strikes your heart 
immediately, oh, okay, my insurance cards, where are they? Do I remember my login for my insurance app, you know, my phone, so I can show them my insurance cards? Did I bring my license today? Oh, no, I forgot my wallet at home today. And, you know, your mind starts to go through all that, and they were just, you know, sitting in the parking lot testing their siren, you know, is all it was. And, boy, you start to fear now, now that's not exactly what this verse is talking about. But maybe you have at, the time, at some point in your life or currently you're living a life that you fear getting caught. And so whether or not they're coming for you, if you see two or three police cars going down the road, you think, oh no, are they going to my house? Are they looking for me? And you begin to fear getting caught. And so you get quiet, you get scared, you get timid, you get cautious. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. They're always afraid of getting caught. But what about the righteous person? You see, the person who's living right, the person who is acting as they're supposed to, oh yeah, they'll sometimes forget their you know, wallet or purse at home and not have their license with them. Or you know, they may forget about their inspection sticker or something like that. And, and you know, not on a routine basis, but you know, they may forget something occasionally or they may be speeding and not paying attention one time here or there. And you know, that's, that's one thing. But the righteous person who has decided, okay, these are the rules and the laws of the land, and so I'm going to obey them. Whether or not I agree with them, I'm going to obey them because they're not causing me to go against God's word. These are the rules of God, and these are the rules of the school. These are the rules of my job or my work, and I'm, just, I'm going to abide by what it is I'm supposed to be doing. I don't have to worry about the boss getting on me about something because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't have to worry about the police arresting me because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't have to worry about God being disappointed in me because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so the righteous can be as bold as a lion. They can stand up and open their mouth and speak and not be afraid that somebody's going to recognize them. <laughs> not be afraid that somebody's going to see their name and say, oh, I remember what you did. The righteous, they're doing what is right. And they're as bold as a lion. There is a strong confidence in the fear of the Lord. And the last one, number six, look at chapter, oh, you're already there. Look at verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Life is richer. It is longer. It is sweeter. It is easier. And it is more fun when I choose to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And I'm not talking about just the day-to-day -day life, and that's true. That when I choose to fear God, yeah, it may keep me from going to that party and, oh, no, I'm missing out on the fun, but you're not really. You're, you're missing out on the temporary fun, but you're missing out on the days of shame that are going to follow it, maybe even months of shame that are going to follow it. Now, you're not really missing out on any fun by not going to that. You have good, clean, healthy fun that doesn't bring shame. You can still have a smile on your face, and you can still enjoy doing things with other people. Oh, yes, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. And think about the term fountain. It doesn't have a, a, um, it, it has a continuous source. The fear of the Lord is a continuous source of life. It just keeps coming, and it just keeps coming because I'm not producing it. I'm not relying upon the adrenaline rush of, of skydiving or something to produce that joy in my life. I'm not relying upon the purchasing a new thing, getting a new car or getting a new couch. I'm not relying upon buying things in order to bring joy in my life. Because my joy comes from the inside. It is a fountain where the source is coming from the Word of God. It's coming from my relationship and my walk with God. But I think we should go back to this point real quick here. Where does this life begin? It begins at our spiritual birth, when you get saved. When you find out you're a sinner, and there's nothing you can do about it, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When you find out that, you know, it, it, like it says in Revelation 21, 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth or worketh an abomination or maketh a lie. Man, that excludes all of us. When you find out about that greatest need you've ever had in your entire life, your sin nature is separating you from God and will continue to separate you from God for an eternity. But then you also find out about Jesus Christ. The whole reason that we are given the Word of God, the whole reason Jesus Christ, you find out about what He sacrificed so that you don't have to remain separated from God for an eternity. Because through him, there is now a healing there, a reconciliation, because he shed his blood on that cross 
to redeem you, to buy you back, to pay the penalty for your sins. So that when you place your faith in him, he has redeemed you and purchased you back. And now you are his once more. There's the beginning of eternal life right there. We're all going to live eternally somewhere. I don't know what you think is going to happen after you die. If you think that you just are annihilated, simply cease to exist. Or if you believe that we were made to be somewhere forever. You see, I believe that, that we're not just cosmic accidents. That for some odd, strange reason, we're here. And then when we're gone, we're just gone. And there's no other purpose other than that. I believe that there is a purpose. Now, we were born to serve the Lord and to love the Lord, to honor the Lord. And now as Christians, we've been saved to work and serve the Lord, to share the gospel with others. We are to be that fountain of life. Are you relying upon something else to bring life and joy into your life? Are you relying upon books or TV shows or music or drugs? Are you relying upon shopping? Are you relying upon your friends, fun games, things to do to bring life and joy into you? Are you relying upon your career to bring life and joy into you? Are you relying upon your marriage or your children to bring life and joy into you? And they will certainly do those things. But you cannot rely upon that. As you know, marriages sometimes struggle. And that life doesn't seem to be there and the joy doesn't seem to be there, but that does not mean that it should be done away with. If you are getting your life and your joy from the Word of God and from your relationship with God, it is going to affect all of those other things. It's going to bring reconciliation between you and God and it's going to bring reconciliation between you and others too. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Your life is richer, longer, sweeter, easier, and more fun when you begin by fearing the Lord. And so I ask you this morning, we've looked at these six things. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Where the foundation, the beginning of it. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. It is a strong confidence and it is a fountain of life. This coming from the wisest man, according to scripture, the wisest man to ever live. Also by inspiration of God. So it has extra special force behind it. I encourage you to think, am I, do I fear the Lord? Well, yes, pastor. Okay. In my actions and what I'm actually doing, does it reveal that I fear the Lord or that I fear men more or that I fear disappointing myself more? Do I fear the Lord? Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Maybe the Lord's worked in your heart <clears throat> and you're unsure this morning about your salvation. If that's the case, here in a little bit, would you get it dealt with? Maybe you're here this morning and you've recognized some areas in your life where you have not been fearing God as you should. Can you just let today, this moment when the Holy Spirit's pricked your heart, can, can you just make a determination? Maybe you need to seek forgiveness for something right now and, and do that. Maybe you need to dedicate something to the Lord. Do that. No, preacher, one of these days. One of these days, you're going to let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. The more you put it off, the thicker that callus gets, and the less you are going to feel it in the future. Let today be the day that the Lord just gets a hold of your heart. And, and I encourage you to think and think and think. Meditate upon it. What is the fear of the Lord? And have I been exhibiting the fear of the Lord in my life? If the Lord's worked in your heart, as the piano plays, would you just come forward and get it dealt with here at the front? Let's all stand to our feet as the piano plays. If you're not sure you're saved this morning, would you come forward and meet me at the front? And I'll take my Bible or have one of the ladies take their Bible and show you how to know for sure you're saved. If you're watching online, would you reach out to me? through YouTube or Facebook or the website and find out for sure how you can know that you're saved. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. He says you can know it. I know it. And it's not because I'm always good. And it's not because I don't ever disappoint God or others. But it's because I've been born into His family. Now I'm a child of God and I don't lose that even when I'm bad. But I have to go and confess my sin like 1 John 1, 9 reminds us to do. 
If the Lord's worked in your heart this morning, would you get it dealt with now?